I'm very gratified that I'm not the only person who's wanting to hear Petula Clark. I see a few people in the chat uh, wanting to hear the Petula Clark version of, of Downtown, which was my father's favorite song in 1966, 67, 68, somewhere in there. So um, they assure me it's on the playlist. So Kay and Marco, others who are waiting to hear Petula Clark, just so you know, she will apparently surface in this playlist. Um, thanks, folks. We're in the home stretch. We've got one great session now on... Uh, the other side of the anchor institution piece, we just finished talking about faith institutions and churches, specifically Christian churches. And now we're gonna talk about uh, that other civic institution called a library. And we have two fabulous librarians who are the head of their library systems in Halifax and in Calgary, Osakashin and Sarah Mayur. And uh, we're really, really pleased to have these folks to talk with us about the potential for libraries, but also just to remind us all what their libraries actually do now. And then what is the future of libraries, which is something that's very important to us at the um, Urban Institute. We're really, uh, really, really keen on what the the uh, potential is for these places, not only uh, in downtowns, but on main streets and in neighborhoods across the country. Uh, but particularly, I know we're gonna talk about downtowns because they're key, key points. And in both of your cases, you have made investments in creating magnificent downtown libraries in those two cities. So very, very pleased to have you come and talk to us about the role and the potential in the future for the next uh, 30 minutes. So we're all yours. I'm gonna pass to you, Osa, and thanks gang for, uh, uh, continuing to tune in. And then when we're finished with the libraries, we're going to do a recap and uh, just sort of see if we can synthesize what we've heard in the last six hours and then how we're going to sit into tomorrow. So over to you, Osa. Thanks. And thanks, Sarah, for joining us. Great to see both right. of you. Hi, everyone. Welcome. Um, Sarah and I love to talk libraries. So this is, we're sort of in our happy place, uh, two different time zones, but happy to be together and happy to be with you. Um, I'm going to share my screen because sometimes a picture tells, you know, takes the place of a thousand words and we only have half an hour. So we're going to be cramming a lot in. Um, I think if there's a if there's a resounding message, it is that libraries are an outstanding investment in our communities and in creating the kind of thriving communities we want. And and um, yeah, we've got a couple of examples and some of these photos will be nostalgic for you because like uh, not unlike other parts of the country we are we are not leaving our homes quite as much as we were but sarah and i remain super hopeful that and we know that libraries will be part of this recovery as we find our way back together so i'm going to do a little screen share there we go okay and i'm going to let sarah take this off because sarah has um yeah sarah's got a little story to tell from a big story to tell from calgary Awesome. Thanks, Osa. Well, lovely to be here with all of you today. I'm Sarah Mayer, the CEO of Calgary Public Library, and, and it's so great to be talking about cities and the role of libraries in great cities and in great downtowns. And, and a part of the reason that I'm here today is because Calgary Central Library really has become an international success story. It opened in 2018 and, and we saw over 2 million visitors in the first year that we were open and it really put Calgary on the map as, as an international destination. It was featured in the New York Times and in Time Magazine and municipalities across the world have begun considering their library systems and their downtown libraries in a new light, I think because of Calgary Central Library. In fact, its success has inspired many other urban centers to really think about investing in their downtown libraries across the country from Ottawa to Saskatoon and beyond to Charlotte, North Carolina to Helsinki and to Portland, Oregon. And a part of the reason that Calgary Central Library is, is so successful is it's a story of what was an empty parking lot in the downtown that had this rising, curving light rail transit line that bisected it, that split it off from the rest of downtown. And, and out of that, out of those constraints, uh, came this beautiful building. And it is a vibrant hub of community activity that really has transformed the entire library system. And this picture right here is um, one of the things that is on all the promotional material for this, uh, this area of the city because it's a vibrant hub and it's that key anchor tenant for the growing and developing community of the East Village. And it's projected to be a neighborhood that will have 11,000 residents by the end of the build out. And so Calgary Central Library is critical to that success story of Calgary's downtown and our East Village. And I know that Halifax's Central Library has 
a similar story of redevelopment and revitalization around it. So Osa and I are going to you know, share over the next half hour with you a bit more about the role that libraries play in a downtown community and, and that they can play in supporting the recovery of your downtowns and your main streets. So Osa, over to you. All right, so in our world in Halifax, and I noticed, uh, um... Pat Sullivan was on the call. Pat's gonna know this street has changed a lot since this picture was taken. In fact, our library opened uh, just over seven years ago. And it has, there almost the, I look at the original photos and the downtown looks so different. You know, parking lots are filled with housing and shops and, and there has been a tremendous amount of downtown change. And while I would love to say the library did it all, I don't think that's true. There were many players in this, but the library made a big difference. And it made a big difference on a couple of levels. Um, in the, you know, in the first year we opened, we had 2 million visitors. And, you know, the last two years of COVID restrictions aside, you know, four to 6,000 people make their way to this library every day. And we have this system and it sort of revitalized the whole use of libraries across our municipality. We, the average person in Halifax sort of has, during COVID, it was about 35 times a year they used the library, even with long periods of closure, pre-COVID, 45 times a year, and we're, we're optimistic we're going to land back there. So, you know, that is 45 times a year for every person. Those are people who are seeking out the library and where we have become embedded in their daily lives. And I think it's a, it's a really interesting example of, a, of that sort of social infrastructure that, that draws people in, um, invites them to connect to one another. So, you know, on the theme of social infrastructure, you know, I encourage you to think about, um, you know, we spend a lot of public dollars on infrastructure and, and, you know, some of that infrastructure people intersect with on a regular basis. Obviously they drive on the roads and pick up the transit, but many of the public spaces that are built, um, they are not actually spaces that the public spends a lot of time in, right? So we spend a lot of money on hospitals. We try not to be in those hospitals very often. We spend money on courthouses, police stations, government buildings, um, schools, even some recreation facilities have memberships and things that may be barriers to access. I think what's magical about the public library and what makes us that sort of anchor social infrastructure is that there are not those barriers. In fact, you know, where else do you land um, in a place where you might be next to somebody who has a completely different life experience, so we cross ages, we cross cultures, we cross lived experiences. And, you know, libraries have been positioning ourselves really well to be the social infrastructure. We're changing our culture. We have removed fines. So, you know, those fines, those pesky fines. I don't think there's a, there's a big city in Canada anymore that still has uh, library <laughs> fines. Um, and that makes me really happy because it is about people coming more often, spending more time uh, connecting with us in a whole variety of different ways, always confident that it is not going to cost them and that they will discover something new. So, you know, food is cool in libraries. Again, some COVID masking restrictions, but overall people are coming to the library to share knowledge, to learn, to connect with other people, to hear, you know, the rising stars of our arts and culture scene. Um, you know, even dogs are invited into the library. We have reluctant, young, reluctant readers. We've discovered, you know, you just have them snuggle up with a dog and they calm down and settle in and their reading improves. Um, I think what I love most about the library is you can come with a purpose or you can just come to be. And, you know, that idea of, of just being, and I, it's hardly a just, um, is just, a, it's a real magic of our community. And that is that sort of low stress, being alone in a public space and not being lonely. It's a pretty magical thing. So, you know, over to you, Sarah. We're on the front line in a lot of ways um, and a lot of quiet ways because we try our very best to do this with dignity. It's so important, that, that dignity. And really in order to play this role where everyone is welcome, libraries are part and have to be part of an interconnected web of supports. And we work in collaboration with a lot of other community agencies and services. The library can't replace other infrastructure and shouldn't, like shelters, healthcare, outreach teams, but it is a critical part of that interconnected web. And in Calgary, we've developed specific partnerships focused on things like safety and security and public space management and activation. 
We work with outreach teams and shelter staff, bylaw, police, and social services. And we provide professional learning support for our staff and our security and safety teams have and deploy naloxone when necessary. And, and we try our best to take a trauma-informed response um, to things that come up. And this is supported by having really an established behavior-based code of conduct, tracking and analyzing incidents in a formal way to learn from trends and, and analysis and work to develop mitigations and actions. Libraries really see what is happening in the community and, and we respond. We provide things like defibrillators, naloxone, food, washrooms, water, free menstrual products, free Wi-Fi, computer access, and, and a whole lot more. The list just goes on and on. We are also an uh, extreme re weather resource, so including shelter from the cold and heat. And we have staff that, that really help anyone that comes in the door triage access to community resources. We help people navigate government services online, especially when they have low language or digital literacy. In short, libraries really reflect the community back to itself. And we lift up and enable other organizations to offer unique supports because we are the backbone community organization. And over to you, Osa, to talk about how we support teens, an important demographic. So teens are great. I, I have often here, I've raised three kids through their teenage years, and I have often heard people talk about, you know, oh gosh, teens, yeah, we got to manage them. Well, at, at Halifax Public Libraries, we gave teens the best real estate in the house. So we gave them the second floor looking out over the street. The intention was that they would have a place to connect and reach out and look for their peers, draw them into the library. But it's much more intentional than that. And, you know, if you look at 70% of youth with mental illness, um, their symptoms started in childhood. So how do we create those community? How would we work as a community support to empower youth, to offer them hope, to allow them to self-determine, to talk, allow them to take on responsibility. We have amazing teen volunteers who sit with younger children, particularly newcomer children whose parents don't speak the language, sit with them and help them with their reading in their early years. You know, there is a real antidote for loneliness in bringing teens together. Um, food brings teens and we've, we've got an amazing groups of teens who will cook and, and feed the community through their public library. They learn the skills, they learn how to read a recipe. Um, and, and our staff, you know, have lots of opportunity with the teens typically will determine the, the plan. So teen advisory councils tell us what they want to do, uh, tell us what they're interested in, and we are there to provide them with, in fact, this great infrastructure to, to realize their ideas. Um, and it's different for every kid. There is not a teen, there are teens who want to play chess and there are teens who want to break dance and there are teens who are want to cook. Um, you know, this picture I'm showing right now is just one of, there are teens who want to change their community. And I think giving them the opportunity to do that, there's really good evidence that that is a game changer in prevention of severe mental illness. In this case, there were teens who said, you know what, we've got people, young teens who can't afford prom dresses. Can we put the call out, invite the community to donate all the prom dresses that were worn once, um, and they had the great prom dress giveaway. So, you know, at the library, we provided the space, we helped the, the communications, the teens were taking a challenge they saw in their community and the library became the vehicle for them to address that. And meanwhile, you know, they, they were great kids walking away with amazing dresses for free. Okay, over to you, Sarah. Newcomers are another important demographic in our communities. We need them to settle. Absolutely. And immigration in Canada continues to increase and libraries really are critical supports for newcomers who want to learn about their new country. In Calgary, I represent the library on our local immigration partnership. I'm sure many of your municipalities have them. And a few years ago, we conducted a study of which organizations newcomers to Calgary visited and where they found resources and support. And the library was the number one organization they connected with by far, because library serves newcomers of all demographics and, and all different experiences. We really were the through line that connected newcomers and all those different organizations that support them. And I think 
The library is also a place where everyone in the community transcends their friends groups and finds themselves side by side with people of other ages, cultures, and lived experiences. Osa uh, shared with me a, a story from Halifax where a newcomer described the library as the first place someone talked to me and showed interest in getting to know me. So libraries support language learning, social connection, and often play a key role in orienting newcomers to this new country, uh, particularly relating to the work of truth and reconciliation in Canada. And as you saw in the photos, we've even hosted citizenship ceremonies at the library. And then libraries also play an important role as, as business incubators. And, and economic recovery is top of mind these days for, for most of us. And I think people sometimes forget or, or maybe never knew that libraries also function as business incubators. These days, libraries are filled with people who are working from home and need to get out of the house. Folks have children at home and need a quiet place for that important meeting. They're getting ready to start a new business or a side gig and need a place to meet up with partners and plan, or they might just need a place to study but being a place for all these activities to occur really supports economic recovery. But libraries also play a key role in, in all the upskilling and reskilling that's so important right now. We offer free training resources like LinkedIn Learning and Gale courses. We provide free access to business databases and periodical subscriptions, and, and we offer small business workshops. Even basic resources like access to computers, Wi-Fi, free printing are essential, combined with job supports, including meetings with career practitioners, help with interviews, um, resume support. In Calgary, we've just launched an entrepreneur in residence program, along with our partners at Platform Calgary, that really is is designed to help support those budding entrepreneurs who might need a leg up, who might want support and new ideas and, and mentorship. So that's just a few examples of how the library is literally the platform for economic recovery for our communities. Over to you, Osa. So when I was a kid, a lot of the learning that happened in libraries lived in books. So somebody had written the information into a book, I borrowed the book and I went home and learned it. And, and I would argue that learning in our libraries now, this is about acquiring skills, confidence, accessing and sharing knowledge. So if we create the right ecosystem in the public library, it's not, it's not a one-way channel from whoever wrote the book to the person who borrowed it. It is learning in a wide variety of different, uh, different ways. So it's independent learning, it's learning cooking, it's deepening our understanding of other cultures, it's embracing arts in our community, it is learning how to sew or 3D print, um, it is, early learning for children. So really interesting studies about the impact of COVID on young children in their emotional and social development. You know, public libraries, as we recover from this, are a really good place for, for parents who might feel isolated to meet each other, for kids to practice sharing, practice, you know, negotiating that toy in a good skill development there. Um, and of course, there's a real matter of literacy. So food literacy, comfortable cooking, digital literacy, and of course, language literacy. And if we really want to start unwrapping language literacy, I'm going to take a whole half hour and talk to you about the really, really frightening impact of, of um, you know, lit low, people with low level literacy and what the impact that has on their employability and their likelihood of involvement in crime and public safety more broadly, academic outcomes, healthcare outcomes. Um, literacy is one of those foundations. If we can help establish that for people in our community, both language and digital, um, it'll be great. Um, and you know, we've got other technologies. So this, we have moved beyond. If you wanna learn how to podcast and you wanna learn how to borrow an instrument and try it out, you always wanted to learn the banjo, your library might be the place where that learning can happen. But we don't do it alone. Do we, Sarah? No, no, we don't do it alone. Collaboration is one of our values. And one of the things that libraries are great at is lifting up other organizations and providing space to amplify the work of others and convening community partners in the care of, of our community. We don't work in silos. So throughout the pandemic, you know, along with providing library services and curbside manners, we've also provided masks, hand sanitizer, vaccines, rapid tests, food, activities for children, laptops, 
you name it. And we've worked with partners to meet community needs. And I think that when libraries are at their most successful is when the community sees the library as the place to realize their potential, whatever that potential might be. Calgary's central library also saw between four to 6,000 visitors a day pre-pandemic. And post-pandemic, we're seeing between two to 3,000 visitors a day. And that's a significant draw to the downtown core. It's people that weren't there and aren't there when the library is closed. One of the core services we provide at Calgary Central Library is free meeting rooms of all shapes and sizes. And a year after opening, we did a study of meeting room use based on postal code. And the map of room bookings by patrons covered the entire city because the Central Library really is a draw. It's the building, it's the services, it's the experiences. And it's the programs and events. And you see here, Orange Shirt Day, Calgary Public, Calgary Central Library really has become that center of civic life. It's not just the building, but it's the entire space it occupies, both inside and outside. We host Canada Day celebrations, um, the Orange Shirt Day event, the number of events in our performance hall in the first year, 540 events in our first year of opening. Do the math on that speak to the activation and that sort of anchor tenant role the library has. So I like to think of three roles for the library to play as programmer, as partner, and sometimes just as space. But when the community utilizes us in all of those ways, then we truly are that civic space that creates a more equitable and resilient community. Osa, over to you. Well, I would add to that that we, we are fundamentally defenders of democracy. So libraries are built on equity. They have always been free. They have always been, the intent has always been to lift everyone up. And, you know, that is happening in different ways. We, we need to be the places where our community comes together to talk about the issues that matter in our community. And it'll be different in each of our, in each of our municipalities. Uh, but, you know, really that idea of it belonging to everybody then invites the conversations. And it, we have become really polarized over the last couple of years. And, and anybody who follows you know, online discourse and, and people sit in an echo chamber, sometimes online, and the, the idea that they believed in the first instance just gets echoed back to them. And what we really need is this idea of the public discourse in the public space to get to know each other again, to recover with one another. Um, you know, I also, think, you know, digital democracy is really important. So the idea that just, you know, think about the, what would you do if your internet went down for three days? Like it would impact your communication. It would impact your ability to maybe pay your bills and do a lot of the activities that you rely on that infrastructure for. We have so many people, a surprising number of people. They're not the people on this call who live without reliable internet access except for through their public library. And, you know, last year, Halifax has a population of 450,000. We had 4.5 million logons to our free Wi-Fi last year. And we did that because we spill it out as far as we can outside our branch. We leave it on 24 hours a day. You know, if people need a Chromebook to access it, we'll give them a Chromebook. Um, and, you know, we take this role of defending democracy to heart, make helping people navigate election systems, inviting them to conversations and debates about what are important issues that we should be paying attention to as a community. That is, you know, that is how we make things work. And we're trusted as a result of it. Um, the folks who were distributing vaccines in our community in a number of community locations said people more readily came to the library with their children to get those vaccinations because there was no wondering if it cost, there was no wondering if they were welcome. Um, you know, our, our community needs the library. So, you know, if we want to talk about, um, now it's our little call to action, Sarah, we can't afford not to invest in libraries. You know, you, you start with your, uh, your pitch and I'll, uh, I'll follow with mine. Sounds good. Well, first off, I want to say cheers to the cities that have done this and are realizing and acting on the possibility that your libraries can provide to help revitalize your downtowns and not just your downtowns, but your entire communities. And to those of you that haven't yet, if you think of your central library or, or think of your branch libraries and see opportunities to update the spaces and the experiences to better serve your community, well, now is the time. Libraries have increased our hours of service, 
Many of us are open on holidays, Sundays year round, and with increased funding and support, we really can do more. In Calgary, our central library and the neighborhood around it really are a destination for the world and for the entire city. Families make it a part of their weekends because there's great coffee, restaurants, playgrounds, and yet the real draw really is the library. With our early learning center, with that space for teens to hang out, interactive exhibits, programs and events, and sometimes even swing dancing and yoga. I said we had 2 million visitors in our first year, and we had over 35,000 room bookings and over 200,000 attendees to programs since then as well. So imagine the impact of those many visitors to your downtown and, and on your community if you increased your investment in your library system. Osa, over to you. Your turn to pitch. Right. So that investment, you know, people look at these beautiful buildings, they think about 4.5 million um, you know, uh, Wi-Fi logons and all this attendance, we are, we are such a drop in the bucket. So at our, on our municipal level, 2% of the operating expenditures of the municipality come to the library. Um, about 10% go to police. And when we talk about, and that's not a criticism of police, it's more to say, if we talk about that upstream work we can do that actually uh, improves the safety of our communities, that improves our ability to work together and to to be alongside one another, we can actually head off a lot of those problems at the past. So there was an interesting study a few years ago in Los Angeles when funding was cut to the library and they decided to keep the library open some days and not some days. And there was a direct correlation to the amount of crime in the community. So this lifting up that we do, it isn't just about the delivery of library service, it actually has a spillover into how we how we work together. So, you know, time spent, the, one of the findings of the LA study was time spent in libraries is time not spent in crim criminally risky situations, right? Where does somebody who experiences domestic violence go to, to have a place and a safe haven? And, you know, that is happening every day. Teens who feel out of sync with their peers, we are that soft place to land. And meanwhile, they're gonna, you know, they're gonna get entertained and they're gonna learn and they're gonna make friends and, and it's kind of magical. So, um, you know, I would argue we can't afford not to invest well in our library. Some of it's infrastructure and, I, you know, kudos to the cities that are doing it. You know, I think you mentioned some Charlottetown, Guelph. I just saw the schematic for Saskatoon where I grew up so excited for Saskatoon. And, you know, that infrastructure is part of it. And the other is really the money to operate it, right? If we spill later into the evening, your downtowns are, are um, you know, are coming to life. So that's our pitch, uh, where I think we're at 627. How do we do, Mary? <laughs> Over to you. Stellar, stellar, but don't go, but don't go anywhere because I wanna continue to have a conversation um, with you folks, because I think that it's uh, just as we, you know, I'm, I can just see in the chat, everybody just wants to listen to you girls. All, I can call you girls because I'm a girl, um, <laughs> uh, uh, you, you women, um, uh, all afternoon, because you're just speaking to the kind of, key elements of what make community work. There are all these different components. And actually one of the things you and I talked about Osa, a couple of weeks ago was, mm -hmm. you know, should we be looking at libraries being open on statutory holidays? Because, mm -hmm. uh, because you know, does it make sense for a library to be closed on Christmas day when there are tons of people that don't celebrate Christmas? And, uh, and then all of a sudden, you know, they would make use of the library on Christmas day. And I even wondered whether we should be looking at 24 seven libraries, which I'm sure would make all the library unions have a nervous breakdown, but I just think, you know, is, is it that crucial an amenity? Well, it is crucial. And actually, you know, when you look at the lens, like what is the thing we're trying to move and what are we trying to address? So if we use actually Christmas day and New Year's day and as examples, if you actually, if part of what we would like to do is to be a partner in the protection of uh, uh, women and children or, or men are also experienced domestic violence, but if we are want to reduce domestic violence, well, we should be open on the days when, when individuals are most likely to experience domestic violence. And you know what? That is Christmas Day, Boxing Day, New Year's Day. Right. So if we start taking additional lenses, we've already built the infrastructure. Now, how do we leverage that to have the greatest impact that we can on the outcome of our communities? Like this is yeah. about thriving. And, and you know, it's, you know, with that 2% of, of the municipal spending, like that, it's not quite a rounding error, but it's really not... But a big so let's ticket item for yeah, us. Yeah, like, yeah, like, yeah, like, let's talk about that for a sec, because I don't think, you know, does it make sense to be funding libraries, sort of the crucible of civilization, 
off of the property tax. I mean, we're going to have sessions now. To, we're going to we're going to immediately from you go into a session on what are the implications of the, the sessions today. And I'm certain that part of what we need to talk about is how are we going to pay for these things? Like, what is the right way to pay for these services? And does it make sense to pay it off uh, an inelastic tax source like property taxes? Don't you, is it not actually of an interest of the provincial and federal governments to have functioning libraries or what did you call them osta defenders oh, no, of I democracy completely, i completely agree with you on that in fact i think i think if we really think about it at every level if if it improves employability right. if it if it reduces crime if it improves uh, educational outcomes if it improves health care then you know really it's of it it should be of absolute interest to every level of government because mm -hmm. if we help people build their literacy and save them from health complications later in their life because they can't read the medication or they can't diagnose their symptoms enough to go to the doctor. Like we've actually, we've actually saved the healthcare system. So my library does get provincial funding. So I get a, about, um, oh, about 15% of my funding from the province. It varies depending How on- How much? One health. five? About 15%. Five. Yeah. No. So, I mean, it's, it's interesting what you just said. I mean, we're going to, we're hoping to do some sort of further investigation. Again, as I said, each of these sessions we're hoping will lead to some robust research and case making. And, and for libraries, your point you just made about um, that you're deferring other costs. In other words, you're saving the healthcare system or are we saving the shelter system or are we, are we keeping people in school longer because the libraries can supplement somehow their attachment to the education system. There was a question in the chat actually about school boards. Um, are you got, do you have contact with school boards? Is there a relationship, sort of a collaborative relationship, Sarah? What's going on in Calgary with school boards? Absolutely. It's a great question because, you know, you think about the impacts for students and families of the last couple of years and libraries have a critical role to play. You know, one of the things we did early on in the pandemic was added a school support librarian in place focused on just working with schools. We have relationships and partnerships and, and we deliver deposit collections to them and we support through electronic resources to help tutoring and supports. And, and we have a really important role to play um, during the summers and, and to support summer learning and really um, hopefully have a positive impact on summer slide in that there's not so much of it, particularly for those kids and families who, you know, don't have access to other resources or other learning. The library is free and open for all. And if we can provide fantastic programs and resources and encourage kids to read over the summer months, um, mm -hmm. and it's so important right now. So it's a real focus area in Calgary is those relationships relationships with school boards and and is, you know, helping students after the impacts of this pandemic and that learning loss. Do you have any anxiety about libraries becoming too much too much? Like, can you be all things to all people? Like, mm -hmm. I'm not hearing that from you at all. And I know that when I was in the United States, we were involved in some library research there. Whoops, sorry. And, uh, and there was some concern, some librarians were pushing back saying, come on, we can't we can't be everything to everybody and we're already dealing with the homeless population. Do you have, do you have aspects of that? Or it sounds to me like you have sort of moved your own approach and your workforce with you to kind of be this kind of adaptive kind of resourceful hub. You know, Mary, I think a part of that really is that we don't do it alone. It comes back to that foundational, we work in collaboration and we support other organizations. So we work in partnership. You know, we might not be the experts um, or the career practitioners, but in Calgary, we work with, with Bow Valley College. And so that's how we're supporting job supports um, and not supporting another organization, but also really meeting those community needs. So I think if we try and do it all ourselves and become the expert in everything, that's a problem. But libraries don't do that. We are really excellent at collaboration and in working with other partners. And that's the key to our success. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you want I to think add anything to that? Go ahead. The funding is a piece of it, Mary, right? If we're facing funding cuts and everything's landing on us, it, that doesn't work, right? But we, you know, we can advocate for the funding. We can, you know, every time in the pandemic when our Department of Health has reached out to us and have, has said, oh, listen, we need to get masks to people. Can you help? Can you host rapid testing? Do you mind hosting vaccination clinics? People know where you are. They can find their way. And, you know, to me, that's actually a real vote of confidence because they understand 
the role that we can play, that we are that trusted institution. I think I saw a really interesting comment in the chat that I don't want to let go by, and it's really around climate change, waste reduction. So if we are going to live within the carrying capacity of the world, we need to figure out how we don't acquire and accumulate so much stuff. And so, you know, libraries, we already have this amazing sharing infrastructure. How do we leverage that? So our health department, we've got a radon problem in our, in our uh, bedrock here in Nova Scotia. You know, radon, people shouldn't buy radon detectors to drop them in their basement for six weeks to test the radon. Like, why not borrow it from your public library? So where, how do we also then even, even leverage our infrastructure and our spaces in a way that, that really improves our climate resilience and our changing the way we consume so just, you know i saw in the chat someone one of the people said that 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 that, that their local library had a fish lending service and i, I, saw that. I, I saw thought that too and i thought okay, they that meant, is a I first thought, that i, know, I, I thought, thought i knew everything yeah, yeah no, i thought <laughs> they meant you know i could borrow a goldfish to come and be at my house but it turns out it's fishing rods but but you just added radon you know come yeah. to the library to get your radon measure so um I, you know i think that we're we're going to round this up and go to our summary session but i think you know, as we've had this two years of extraordinary challenge, mm. you know, we're suddenly put into a place of really looking around and saying, what can we count on? What are, what's, where's the place we can go? And how do we make sure that we can find a way to reach out to one another on platforms that you only really provide when we're in a crisis like this again? You know, and we've got to make sure that you've got the right resources, the library systems have the right resources and the capacity and the staff and all the all the kinds of things that you're going to need as we continue to build someone. I see Robert, my colleague, has just put in the um, chat that libraries are resilience embodied. You are embodied resilience. So um, yeah. so thank you for joining us. The other thing is libraries can be beautiful. They can be um, unbelievably dynamic. The pictures that you were showing, fantastic. Um, we all, as I say, know of iconic buildings that are libraries and they can be enlivened with programming and different kinds of uses and different kinds of people. And so thank you for being part of this discussion about how do we bring back downtowns and the critical role of anchor institutions being libraries. Can I add one more point, Mary? Go. He's talked about design. You know, as people pay attention, care about the design. Like it is fascinating. We build these beautiful buildings and everybody's behavior elevates. Like they're gracious, they're kind, they take great care of it. You know, mm -hmm. we allow food in Central Library and people aren't smearing pizza. They want to take care of it because it's beautiful and it belongs to them. So, mm -hmm. you know what, that is, so don't just go utilitarian, like build beautiful and it, it improves everybody's life. There's beauty in great architecture. There we go, there we go. I can see people's hearts singing on that. Sarah, great to see you. Oh, so always great to see you. Thanks for all the librarians that came on. There's quite a number of them in the chat and we oh, appreciate they are you. the bomb. They are the <laughs> bomb. Are great people. It's, just be that clear. I'm going to go buy I'm going I'm to go borrow a fish tonight. And uh, thank you for joining us. And I'm now going to invite our wrap up panel to come on and uh, a bit of you to Osa and Sarah. Thanks, gang. Uh, and you. now I'm fortunate that we're going to have some fresh minds here are going to come and help us make sense of what we've been listening to.